Uh, after uh, today, I'm delighted to welcome uh, our speakers, Heather Jack. Uh, Heather will be known to many of you, I'm sure. She's a trustee of the Scottish Council and Archives, and she's director of HGBS Limited, delivering information and records management specialist support to public and private organisations in Scotland and further afield. Uh, after Heather's talk, um, we'll be delighted if you could uh, ask questions or raise any points. I'm sure Heather will be happy to, to answer them. So without further ado, can I please ask you to make sure your mics are switched off? They, they should be. Uh, I'm, I'm now going to hand you over to Heather, whose title of her talk is a Personal Story. Heather. Hey, good afternoon. Let me just get in here and get my presentation. I hope it's all worked very beautifully. Um, can everybody see my slide and is it maximised? Seems fine, Tyler. Excellent, right. Well, I'm just going to move this little video out of the way. There we go, we're fine. Well, um, thank you so much to the Scottish Council and Archives for hosting this series of webinars on why records management matters and to all of you for taking time out at lunchtime to listen to what I've got to say. I have an absolute passionate belief in the fundamental role of effective record keeping and records management in maintaining a healthy society. It's vital for enabling accountable, transparent and trusted government and effective, efficient and innovative service delivery across all sectors, especially in partnership. It also empowers communities and safeguards the rights and freedoms of individuals. My focus today is to illustrate this using the story of a really remarkable person and how records management has impacted on her life. Due to an active criminal court case still in action, uh, I will be referring to this person as Miss X. Much of the story I will relate applies to past circumstances and must be viewed in that context. However, some of what I will relate are issues that we have right here and right now. We need to do what we can to address historic abuse and other impacts of historic record keeping, but it is fundamentally important that we ensure that those lessons that we learn are actually documented, applied and outcomes monitored going forward. Let's try and get to my next slide. There we go. So now let's turn to Miss X's personal story from a records management perspective. Ms X was groomed and sexually abused by one of her teachers at state school. It started in 1976 when she was 12 years old and continued until she was 15 in 1981. In the 1990s, she reported her experience of child sexual abuse to the relevant local authority. It is now 2020, 46 years since the start of that abuse, and Ms X is still pursuing justice. The original abuse has been compounded again and again over subsequent decades by individuals and by public and third sector bodies who have failed to address the wrongs done to her to help her to get justice and closure. While by no means the whole of her story, record keeping and records management shortcomings and inconsistencies have played a significant part in the failure to uphold her rights, freedoms and pursuit of justice. These shortcomings and inconsistencies can be broken down into five interrelated themes. Creating records in the duty to document, challenges to effective retention, protection and management of records, legislative shortcomings, ownership, partner working and sharing, and records management investment, influence, capacity and capability. In the rest of my talk today, I will take each of these themes provide the context from Miss X's story, expand on the themes more generally in terms of their issues and opportunities too we have to address them based on progress in these areas in the, in the intervening years and opportunities and finally calls to action to capitalise on these to pursue a policy of holistic continuous improvement, i.e. within and beyond the boundaries of the records management community. The first of these themes is creating records and the duty to document. A key element of Ms X's pursuit of justice was in finding corroborative evidence of her abuse, evidence in the forms of records held by those agencies involved in her story. In her own words, the trend seemed to be that the records do not go very far back, only to 2008 or 2012, 
When it comes to child sexual abuse or inappropriate relationships or allegations, it seems that local authorities do not feel the need to keep records or have not had guidance from somewhere else saying that they must keep such records. Without corroboration, her case could not proceed to trial in a criminal court. In the very first webinar in this Why Records Management Matters series, Rosemary Agnew highlighted a key insight she'd acquired as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic experience, asking the fundamental question about who should decide what records get created in the first place. In Ms X and so many other people's cases, the importance of the creation and retention of allegations of abuse. What is our duty to record and more fundamentally, whose requirements should we be gathering? I'll discuss later legislative requirements in relation to, re to, in relation to record creation. What I want to highlight now is the importance of involving our client base, the public we serve in a public sector scenario, the people we represent and support in a third sector scenario, prospects and customers in a commercial sector scenario and a holistic combination of these where partnerships exist across these sectors. Another relevant point here is what I believe is the mistitling of records retention schedules. It presupposes that the certain records should be created in the first place, and yet time and again, my clients will look at available guidance such as the SCARS, Scottish Council and Archives records retention schedule guidance and say, that's not relevant to us because we don't hold them, i.e. we don't create such records in the first place. I believe we need to fundamentally rethink the purpose and the approach to, to retention schedules and related to this information asset registers. These should not be based on what we already do, but what we ought to be doing. Those record creation requirements informed by the requirements of all relevant stakeholders. There is undoubtedly a great will and desire to right the wrongs of the past. However, a key aspect of this work in practice is getting record creation uh, right through a duty to document. And another of the themes is the challenges to effective retention, protection and management of records. Again, in Miss X's words, the information she sought was not forthcoming. Records had either not been retained or could not be found. Some may never have been created in the first place. When people have come forward to alleged abuse, local authorities can confirm that only by keeping records. But there seems to be a trend of poor record keeping. And that is very much the experience of many, but I think it's so important to understand what the challenges are ongoing to effective retention, protection and management of records so that we can address them. I've obviously listed here a number of those from the consistency and rationale for deciding retention periods, because one size does not fit all, actually implementing retention in practice. A good example of that is what happened with um, the introduction of the data protection, uh, general data protection regulation. Lots of one-off exercises for people to get rid of personal data in their records, but didn't actually tackle the root cause of over retention and duplication. There's also a whole digital complexity and cost and so many things that need to be addressed from long term retention and preservation so we can access those records that have to be retained very often far longer than technologies that created them. There's also the whole perception that records and information management is an administrative and not a strategic function and related to that, the disconnect with business planning processes and often multiple IT systems that store and process them. And then there's a the moral maze, the risk to individuals, for example, if the personal data that's been retained is not protected, well, it does still need to be retained. And then there's costs of retention. Related to this also is, oops, sorry, I was busy looking at my things here and I flipped the page too quickly. Another related part to this is obviously the ownership partner working and sharing with records spread across large multifunctional organisations, across multiple partner organisations and contractors. And that obviously is things like dispersed records to issues around ownership and responsibility and to compliant sharing. And it's really excellent that the Public Records Scotland Act have got elements 14 and now 15, um, a, which actually are all about 
helping a uh, public sector organisations ensure that there is proper sharing of information in an appropriate way, and in particular in relation to those records that are held by contractors on their behalf when de delivering their statutory functions. So these are very kind of positive things, but we need to be thinking about the guidance there and how we implement and monitor information sharing agreements and contract clauses. Having them in place in the first place is really important, but how do we know whether they're actually working and the situation is actually improving? Another theme that was uh, very pertinent um, for Ms X is in relation to legislative shortcomings. A key aspect of compliance with and implementation of legislation and the exercising of people's rights set out within legislation lies in the creation and retention of records. Standards relating to this aspect of legislative content are varied from implicit requirement to create and retain records to a detailed prescriptive list. Explicit retention periods are rarely included and tend to state a minimum period with the obvious exception of data protection, which, while specifying a maximum period, requires that to be based on a case by case basis. The balancing of a number of often conflicting factors and therefore is open to wide interpretation. Um, and I have to say, and this is in relation to the bottom main bullet point in my slide, there's a really exciting opportunity now for us to address some of these failings when it comes to legislative handling of records management. It relates to a bill that's currently passing through Scottish the Forensic Medical Services Victims of Sexual Offences Scotland Bill. Um, and a significant part of that bill relates to the retention periods for evidence, in this case, retention of forensic evidence in relation to the medical examination of victims of sexual abuse incidents where that evidence is not transferred to the police as part of a criminal, criminal investigation. And it's actually as a result of my ongoing support of Ms X um, that I have had the most amazing opportunities to actually really exercise my passion in trying to make a difference with records management and I'm extremely grateful to her and one of those moments was in relation to this bill where on um, when it was a, the, the sorry I'm now gabbling away here it was the, the as it says here the the a bill, a, the bill the first stage bill report committee debate on the 1st of October this year when I was able to write some information in the background on two particular issues. One was about um, record criteria for retaining records and another one was about the linking of forensic evidence with the related case records. And that background information was actually read out by Brian Whittle when he was producing that particular evidence, one of which was this. There is an opportunity for that bill to set a precedent of getting records retention and wider records management requirements right within legislation. We recommend the input of records management expertise versus via memorandum of understanding with the Keeper of the Records Scotland and the drawing up of new and amendments to existing legislation. It was a real pivotal moment in my world as, um, as, as a records manager and I really, really hope that we can all work on this and move forward. And that element, um, I think it's really, really significant. Also related to information rights, like also related to legislation, is information rights legislation in practice. Uh, so, Ms. X used freedom of information legislation to make requests to all local authorities for statistics and details of retention practice of records relating to allegations of child sex abuse in schools. This also revealed record keeping and records management shortcomings and inconsistencies. Again, in her words, she said, grappling with my paper here, the figures that I'm getting back differ hugely and the records that are being kept are minimal from what I can see. Some local authorities will not disclose any records and instead cite data protection legislation, although I have not asked for names or anything like that. And the thing is, we do have some really good legislation and definitely things are improving. We also need to keep on top of that for the Public Records Scotland Act, now that the first round of, um, of uh, records management plans have been reviewed by the Keeper and we go into the next round, which is very much about on an improvement basis, we need to start looking for measures to be taken to actually see our improvements be, uh, actually happening. 
we so often data protection is used as a barrier, sometimes unintentionally through misinterpretation and misinformed barriers to sharing and to retention. And also because there's so much scaremongering that goes around, partly by commercial organisations trying to make money out of it. And in terms of FOISA, yes, there are gaps in coverage and there's no duty to document, but it's really, really, really hopeful that some of the recommendations from the post legislative scrutiny review that took place are going to make a real, real difference. So I think there is a lot of reasons to be cheerful there. The final theme is about records management, investment, influence, capacity and capability. Um, and actually, I'm just sorry about this. I think this also comes to mind in terms of what we said before. Legislation, regulation and standards um, are definitely required as our records management frameworks and organisations to implement them. However, the real test of good record keeping is in the outcomes and experiences of people and processes those records have been managed for. This has been starkly demonstrated by Ms X in her uncovering of record keeping shortcomings and the impact on this that it's had in her life as she tried to seek justice for that abuse she suffered as a child. More needs to be done to develop practical outcome based performance management frameworks for record keeping and the management of records. And so despite the increasingly robust information governance related to framework in Scotland, I really do think when it comes to implementing national legislation and corporate policy, there continues to be a disconnect between the creators and users of information, records managers responsible for proper governance and effective use of that information, developers and implementers of enabling technologies and policy makers setting agendas for organisational, economic and societal futures. And some of those areas, I mean, very much in fact, a lack of investment records management, a lack of influence in those areas, for example, at national, sexual and organisational levels in terms of things like digital and business transformation initiatives. Quite often, records managers and others related in that area are brought in when things go wrong or they're considered to be an afterthought or it's considered to be about retention. There's maybe just too over, much of an overemphasis on data protection and information security. Or again, there might be just too much um, advice out there, inconsistent advice. And it's particularly hard either for people in large organisations who have small teams to support huge numbers of people and functions or overly stretched people with little training experience in smaller organisations who still have those same obligations in relation to information rights and other legislation. Um, and also really importantly, I think needs to be more business cases that emphasise the so what of records management to help impact and improve this lack of records management, investment, influence, capacity and capability. Some positive points though, COVID impact, and this may just be a coincidence, but it's breaking down barriers between organisations and jurisdictions. A good example here is the work that has been done with the Information Records Management Society, Microsoft 365 Roundtable, which has led to an international um, a, well, a records management consultative advisory board with Microsoft, with key people from different roles and across across the, the world. And it's a, it's a really, really important um, thing that's happened here. And it's something that can be repeated. And we also have really good examples where there's been standards collectively produced, for example, the Scottish Council Archives retention schedules. So as I start to near the end of um, my talk, some calls to action. I think we really want to have more collaboration across and beyond the records management sector. As I've just mentioned about, we've already seen that with um, the RMS um, roundtable work now that's developed. Currently, there's um, um, a draft British standard code of practice for the management of records out for public consultation. Please do participate. I will provide links for various things in here so that you can do that. And that consultation is open to January the 4th. Participate, collaborate, focus on your areas of specialism. Let's make this as really, really excellent standard as we can. We need to start having records management specialists as part of initiatives and projects from the start. That's locally, national and beyond. 
We want to get records management points properly specified in legislation and implementation guidance and things like what's happening in relation to the bill I mentioned earlier. There's opportunities here. We need to grab them. We need to grab them together. And we must focus on the present and especially the future while we still fight to address the wrongs of the past. And in terms of the work, we need to work on so what for records management, looking at risk reduction, benefits realisation, performance improvement, and ultimately better futures for all. And in conclusion, just get my in conclusion bit of paper here. I said being here for a moment. If we are properly to embed effective records management practice into business as usual across public, private and third sectors, we must be proactive in addressing the issues I've raised in my talk today, not least by raising awareness of why records management matters. Not for its own sake, because how we manage or fail to manage our records and information has a direct impact on every aspect of life as personified by Ms X's experience. It has the power to inform or mislead, to unite or divide, to create or destroy, to pre protect or to harm, to empower or disenfranchise. Thank you very much. And now come out of my slides and see if there's any questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Heather. That was a really interesting and um, fascinating uh, presentation, which you covered a lot of really important themes, and so some of the themes are ones that have that have run through this uh, series of events. Um, some of the things you you, you stood out uh, um, struck me very strongly. One is you talked about records management being perceived as an administrative rather than a strategic function. You know, and we have heard about how compliance with the Public Records Scotland Act and good records management can avoid fines. You know, can avoid bad things from happening. Um, but we've also heard from Maria Lim, who's the chair of IMS Scotland and who works in the commercial sector, how goods records management can contribute to business efficiency. So there's, there's that positive side of it. But but it, what it occurred to me is it, it seems that you know a lot of people will still see records management as something that needs to be done rather than something that, that uh, should be done for all its different positive um, Im impacts that, you, that you, you've highlighted. Is there a need for a, a strategic vision for records management in, 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 well, in, in Scotland? We're talking about the importance of it, you know, obviously not just in the public sector, which is what PRSA relates to, but, but across all sectors that records management is not something that is just for administrators. It's something that people on every organisation needs to think about. I absolutely believe that and um, those who have heard me talk before know all about me and my compelling stories. I think the problem is often people still have um, terminology is really an important part in this and records management for some will give images of kind of in the paper days. It might give images of other people doing that kind of a job. It's and it's talking about the what, which is records management rather than the so what. And, and I have to say that one of the bits I love most and why I'm so passionate about this area of work is absolutely about the so what. Um, and I know a lot of people, they find it quite hard to translate that into the so what for the organisation. I think there's a really great opportunity, for example, using records management plans and assessment review aspect of that for for people in, in their organisations and others who actually do assessment review things within a uh, private sector. When they're doing key performance indicators, have some of those that actually are the so what for the organisation. A good example, you often see policies, records management policies and others saying, here's the benefits of records management and it's the usual, it's accountability, efficiency, blah, blah, blah. I agree. But you need to take those bullet points and turn them into the what does that look like? If I'm saying these are the benefits, how do we realise those benefits? And when you start to map those, an idea you're taking them from the vision of the business and actually turn them into saying this is how what, this is how much the duplication is right now, what a big nightmare, and this is actually impacting on X, Y and Z of our benefits, and then going back after doing that baseline measurement after things have changed and saying, hey, look, things have improved. I could go on and on. I'm going to stop talking. But but yes, we need a strategic vision for records management, John. OK, um, OK. Do we have any questions from, from, from people here? I 
can hear rumble and tummies. <laughs> I think that's probably probably what the issue is. Um, what, one other thing that you said, Heather, that struck me was that there's an overemphasis on data protection and information security. Um, we deal with a lot of smaller organisations at the Scottish Council and Archives. Recently, we've been working with community groups you know, who have responsibility for uh, material, and they've had to think about GDPR and, in many cases, panic about it. Mm. Um, in terms of that overemphasis on, on data protection, information security, um, you also talked about really we should be looking at focusing on the present and the future, not not just trying to address the wrongs of the past. Um, do you think PRSA? I mean, it's, it's too early to say, but do you, do you think the Public Records Scotland Act is, is helping to, to achieve that? I, would, I mean, I was um, listening when, when you were speaking, I know that was one of the questions that was asked of him and his feelings were that at the moment more really it is too early to say, but hopefully particularly, and I think I mentioned that in my talk too, with the second round, when it's now we've gone from original records management plans to the ongoing continuous improvement and hope we can see that. But I do I really believe that until we actually get that joining up between the so what of PRSA and, and, and obviously Public Records Scotland Act was prompted by Shaw, but it's absolutely about every aspect of proper record keeping for all those benefits I talked about. Until such times as we find ways of actually correlating those two, I think it's really quite hard to be able to really see if things are being improved or not. And and I think you could even, I think it'd be brilliant to see some kind of pilot in some area, a little proof of concept. I think that would be a brilliant thing as a way of showing how to do that. OK, um, so we I saw that uh, Anthea, Andrea Wells uh, had uh, her hand up. Andrea, if we can unmute yourself. Or can we unmute you? Got it. Sorry. There we go. Right. Hey. Uh, I did write a message there. Um, what do you mean by the duty to document, and why doesn't FOIA cover it? And what can we do about that? I think <laughs> a, I think there's a good chance that that is it, it's coming in the direction. Obviously, there's been this post legislative easy for me to say post legislative scrutiny review, which came up for recommendations of which that was one. Um, and I think there's actually calls coming from a number of different areas, including ICSA around that. So I think that that I do think I didn't want to paint a completely bleak picture. I think improvements are being made. And in particular, I think more and more as people are getting a voice, there's more of a clamouring for those kinds of things. So I believe that we are going in the right direction of travel. Dylan, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that yourself. Um, sorry, can I just ask one thing? Um, I don't really, I'm not from a records management background and I don't know what you really mean by duty to document. What exactly does that mean, duty to document what? I think duty to document those things that need to be documented. It's a bit like I was talking about the records retention schedule. It's often about focusing on retaining things. We need to be making sure that people are creating them in the first place. Ah. In order to know that they need to be created, there needs to be a duty to be doing that for whatever circumstances those are. And some of that sometimes appears in legislation, often not, and, and there are so many other areas that it can also cover. Does that, does that make sense, Andy? Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, your talk's great, by the way. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate <laughs> that. Love you. <laughs> you too. <laughs> well, just, just in reference to that last comment, um, Heather, duty to document. Uh, w one statement I've, I've referenced a couple of times in this series is the one that was released by the International Council of Archives early in the year, just at the beginning of uh, the, the COVID crisis and lockdown, about the duty to document in the time of crisis is more important than ever. You, you have mentioned you know, some of the things that, that COVID has revealed are, are the experiences, you know, particularly you know, over the last six, seven months. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot of negative stuff that we can, we, we so can identify, but, but, but the positive stuff seems to be that the value of evidence is going to inform decision making and is informing decision making both now and in the future. Absolutely. No, I absolutely agree. And, and that's the thing about it. If we something happens and then we retrospectively think, oops, we better be documenting evidence in order to be looking at it's it, it's kind of the wrong way around. And that's that big the big concern is A not having that duty to document, but B also because of the complexity of 
information now and the way different ways in which it can be created and shared and what's the actual record and so on. There's a lot of effort needs to be put into that to make sure not only the evidence is recorded, but recorded in such a way and managed in such a way that it is authentic and accessible and trustworthy and so on. So proactive effort needs to be put into doing that in, in reality. OK, well, I just want to finish on, on, a, on a, uh, something I tweeted uh, yesterday. I, I saw a story, it was an American story uh, about Donald Trump. Sorry to bring Donald Trump into this conversation, but uh, 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 the, the story was that a government watchdog called the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington and other groups filed uh, a lawsuit against uh, Donald Trump, his son-in-law, Jared Kushner in the White House on Tuesday to prevent them from destroying records during his remaining time in office. And I mean, is there, do you feel that Public Records Scotland Act you know, has now helped to prevent that destruction of records? Because the, the, what Ian Levitt you know, made quite clear from the, his presentation was that post-war there was widespread destruction of, of records and, that, and that's led to so many of the gaps in, in knowledge. I certainly think it's got, a, it's definitely got a role to play in that, but I think it's also back to saying it's brilliant that we've got the legislation but it's just making sure that we are implementing it properly. So some of the challenges I talked earlier around there about inconsistencies in retention rules, it's the devil being in the detail when it comes to those things. So absolutely, it's I'm really, really, really chuffed to bits that it exists. And I know that beyond public sector, people love it as a, as a, as a good kind of model plan approach. But there's more to it than that, and, we, and it's getting into like the nitty gritty of that, and not just ourselves, but with those people who are actually responsible for those areas of work, and and all those other parties I mentioned about that, that we're not joined up enough. There's not a holistic enough an approach. Okay, well, well, thank you very much, Heather. I think uh, the the tummies are rumbling even louder now, so I think on, on that. Right, we'll, we'll finish up. Thank you for a really fascinating, interesting talk. And as usual, can I ask everyone to give their virtual round of applause to Heather? Um, thank you all very much for coming. And thank you, thank for you Heather. And thank you for listening to me. And round of applause to all of you too. And enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Okay, no problem. Bye bye.